1969, there was an article in a Memphis Daily newspaper that mentioned the use of nude models at the Memphis Academy of Arts. This article and this information eventually led to a number of attempted crimes and one significant crime at the Art Academy where I was a student at about this time. Shortly after the article appeared, there was quite a bit of public reaction in a very conservative uh, southern town, but one individual in particular took this very seriously. One day, a watercolor and drawing instructor named Dolph Smith, who taught at the Art Academy, found that someone had put in the gas tank of his car what appeared to be a bomb, a, an attempt at blowing up the gas tank of his car while he was driving it. Sometime later, in December of 1970, two other instructors, Burton Calicott and Ted Fares, both of whom were instructors of mine, they found, as they carpooled to work together in the same vehicle, they found that someone had put the same kind of incendiary device in their gas tank. Uh, fortunately, neither of these ignition devices went off. I've included a link to an article in Memphis Magazine website that goes into this in much greater detail. But by March of 1971, I showed up for school like everyone else and found out that the history teacher at the Art Academy the previous night had had a home invasion where a man wearing a disguise had kidnapped his son and had demanded the removal of nude photographs and that we cease using nude models at the Art Academy. Some years ago, someone made a documentary film called The Art Academy about this school and the history of this school. A short segment of that film includes this incident, and I'm going to uh, play a bit of that now and show you exactly what transpired. In Memphis, Tennessee, there is an amateur critic who may not know much about art, but certainly knows what he doesn't like and has a unique way of enforcing his views. Del Vaughn reports. The Memphis Art Academy usually operates without much fanfare or controversy, but their most recent international photography show brought reaction not only from some segments of government, but from one man who took the situation in his own hands. I'm Eddie Beatty. Uh, my connection to the Memphis College of Art is that as a consequence of one of their shows, I was kidnapped. Well, some fool went there and saw what he considered uh, pornography. There are some photographs of nudes in the show, uh, that these uh, must be removed and that uh, the uh, uh, people at the Memphis Academy of Arts would agree not to use any nude models in the work at the Academy. Either the photographs come down or the son gets killed. He left with Eddie as a hostage and said that if I complied with his demands, then I would get Eddie back safely. That night I was watching, I believe, the semifinals of the NCAA tournament. And uh, all of a sudden, off the den in the foyer, I hear a little commotion. And I realized that it's not just a joke, that somebody's actually uh, kind of ordering my father around and saying, don't look at me. And I was a little concerned, but the ball game was going into overtime. All of a sudden, through the doorway, I see a little revolver, and I'm thinking, if I scare this guy, he may just inadvertently pull the trigger in my direction. So I said, <clears throat> excuse me, and I could see the guy kind of lurch a little bit, and he says, come out here and don't look at me. He has me tie up my family with some torn dish rags. My dad wouldn't let me go out the door unless I got on a, a robe and some house shoes. But I couldn't find my slippers. So I actually go get dad's hugely oversized slippers. I also had a t-shirt over my head, so I couldn't look at the guy. What happened last night after you left the house? We got in dad's little Volkswagen square back and he was nervous, but I had to, even with my head covered, I had to 
pull the seat up for him. And I believe the keys were probably already in the ignition, and he didn't know how to drive a stick, apparently. So he lurched around. I think he even killed the car once or twice. Apparently, we ended up only about a half mile from the house, at which point we transferred into another car, and then he started driving. Did he say anything to you about the academy or about the display? He just said he had, it had caused him many sleepless nights just thinking about it. It really made him sick. And he was kind of talking about the moral decadence and myriads and myriads of sins will visit, you know. Well, it so happened that that night, there was a foreign movie over on Poplar Street that used to have foreign movies. I guess it happened to call Ted Russ and say, I I'm, I'm, I'm just want to get away from dirty pictures. I'm maybe going to one. I don't know, but it says it's a very good picture there. So I went, to, went, and in the middle of that picture, the manager came and got hold of me and said, you want it on the telephone. And with Ted Russ, he said, leave the movie and come at once. We're all meeting over at WHBQ right in a minute. Would probably make a little bit of difference to know what his ransom demands were. Because when he came into the house, he, he told my dad, get on WHBQ and uh, tell them that this art exhibit's been taken down. So says, get on 10 o'clock news. Well, we went over there and we said, yes, we're gonna take the pictures down. Uh, wouldn't you? To remove the fit pictures and promise that we would not do it again, we, would do, we made all kinds of promises. Finally, it gets to be about 10 o'clock, so he's got WHBQ on the radio and we're just driving around and have a little bit of news and no dad. And then they cut away and they play a few songs. And I remember one of the songs was the Friendly Stranger in the Black Sedan, Don't You Hop Inside My Car. So uh, that wasn't real comforting. The radio comes on and says, it's 1017 and still no dad. I even thought when he was in the house giving the demands that he was talking about WHBQ television. Apparently he gets out to a pay phone and he makes a phone call. And then within five minutes of his getting back in the car, on the radio I hear my dad's voice saying to the man who entered my house, uh, essentially your demands have been complied with and you know, please release my son. Then we went, uh, left the t uh, station and went over to the academy and physically helped in taking all the pictures down. We were of course quite ashamed to have to do that capitulate to the numbskull. It was now three days before the end of the exhibit. The next day, over the uh, AP and UPI wire services, they had sent out this bizarre story. And at that point, we hit the New York Times, the Bombay News in India, the China Herald. I got things sent to me from everywhere. And then we started hearing from people who read the story in the Saigon news during the war. And the detective news made it two months later how all this happened and they still haven't caught the guy. Did he go to prison for No, they said they couldn't find him. They didn't know who it was, but they later found out who it was. And then he went out and... He left Memphis. His name was Newton Estes. But that's not the last they ever heard of Newton Estes. I did a little Googling and found what I believe is the same man. In the early 1980s, Newton C. Estes, ranting and raving about pornography and school busing, attacked a U.S. Supreme Court Justice, Byron White. This same Newton Estes did live in Memphis during the period of time that these events occurred. And he was a bit of a stickler about pornography. That didn't keep him from being convicted, however, of trying to molest a little girl in 1989. Religious people sometimes have problems dealing with sex. The temptations of naked women and little girls seems to affect them in the most bizarre way. Check out the links to see the entire film. Not on YouTube, of course, because... You know, naked women.